Well, good morning, everybody. My name is Alex Husted. I'm on the board of Philadelphia Stories, and I'm welcoming you to the sensory experience in fiction. I hope you're all having a great time so far. And I'd like to introduce Rachel Coben, who's going to be presenter today. Take away, Rachel. Thank you, Alex. I appreciate that. Welcome, everyone. Um, let's see. Um, people come on camera. Hi, Eli, Christine, Andrea, and I, Lauren, I can't quite see. Is that, is it Lauren? Is that what it is? Um, it's kind of cut off on my screen, unfortunately. I, Jen, I'm sorry, Jen Plaza. Okay. Good morning, Matthew. Chuck. Hi. So, so do people have their objects with them? Okay. It, it, it could just be one. Um, I'm just going to see if Mara and Eli come on screen. Although, are you there? Are you listening and not wanting to come on screen? Because that's OK, too. Um, just wait for just a minute more, a minute or two more. And everyone has, does everyone have their object and a notebook and a pen or a pencil, whatever your preferred writing instrument is? Okay, no problem, Eli. That's absolutely fine. Um, okay, so. Um, And Hera, are you gonna just are you gonna listen in and not come on screen? Um, you know what? This is weird. I can't get myself to come on screen. Is that Heather? Yeah, or I'm sorry. Yeah, this is Heather O'Mara. I apologize. Okay, no, that's okay. Um, Alex, are you still there or? Yeah, I'm still here. I can't. Um... There's nothing I can do. For, I can mute and unmute people, but there's nothing I can do with your video. You know, okay. as like as a you know, I think that's just a general privacy okay. thing that I can't, can't okay. mess with people's okay. video. So we, can, we can go on, Heather. That's you know, that's fine. And Hera, are you there? But are just listening in. Um, okay. And and is it Watsuki? Is am I saying that correctly? Uh, it's actually Watsuki. The U is silent. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Um, so yes. good morning. This is Hara. I'm Hi, Hara. listening in. Not a camera person. <laughs> no problem. Okay, no problem at all. Okay, so let's get started. Um so actually it's interesting because I I I run workshops under the heading of uh well uh, the Philadelphia Writers Workshop, which which I started 10 years ago. And um normally I bring in the prompts. And so the writers in the workshop, it's a surprise for them, you know, where they don't know what I'm going to do or bring or say. In this case, um, we all thought about it ahead of time. And so I'm um, just wondering how many people um, did it bring already? Have you already have things that you want to write about just even coming in? Did it kind of spark some things? No? Okay. Okay, that's absolutely fine. It's fine if it didn't. Okay, so we are going to just jump right um, into writing. Um, at the end of the session, I have a handout I can send you with every how to contact me, uh, and it includes a short story that I thought was a great example of what we'll be talking about. Um, so first, we're just going to do some writing. It's just three minutes to write a very basic story. And so this could be based on the object that you chose or objects, or it could just be the most basic narrative of something that happened to you or a character this week. Um, so we're gonna, we're gonna write for about three minutes. Um, and then I'm gonna ring this bell and I'm gonna say, 
find a place that you can come back to at another time and you'll we'll start writing and then um, we're going to come back and do a little bit more writing and then we're going to talk about what we wrote and if anybody is willing i may i'll ask you to read out loud um and if not don't worry i have a backup plan for that but um there don't worry there will be no critiquing of anyone's writing today that is just not right in this setting um so let's begin um go ahead and just write the most basic just this happened and that happened and that happened and this happened. Um, I'm writing the prompt in the in the chat for those who just arrived. <clears throat> We probably won't have time to do uh, if you just arrived to you probably won't have time to do this so because we are ending now. So find a place that you can come back to at a later time um, and um, I will do that. So I just I put this that prompt in there. This is just the bare bones of the story. So um, now what I'd like you to do is go back and think about how you can use one of the objects that you chose to bring to life either one aspect of your story or as much of it as you possibly can um so what you're trying to do i mean your character if you have your character stop and have one of these objects in the story if you can think of a way to incorporate incorporate it in any way to bring in smell sight touch sound um or taste. It doesn't have to be every single one, just one of those things. So the idea is to expand one little part 
and bring focus in on that and see what happens when you when you bring life to those those areas. So we'll have a little bit more time for this one. This is to go really to go back to the same exact story and add some more. And if you want to get this time switch to the computer, that's fine, since you're really, this is a rewrite in a sense.
Okay, take one minute to find a place that you could come back to at a later time. And I just realized that I put the assignment and not the assignment, the where we were the prompt in the first prompt in the uh, only to Alex. So this is what we started with was a very simple story. And then we went back to it and added more detail. So that's, that's if anybody came in late, that's what we were doing. <laughs> You're wondering what we were doing. Okay, so um, I'm wondering just how did the people experience that? Did the, um, did thinking about those senses help you bring more, breathe more life? Did you feel like this second draft had more going on in it? Um, okay, well, let's see. Um, did anyone want to read their two drafts? <laughs> yeah, go ahead, Jen. Okay, now listen, I wanna say something because Jen is really putting herself out there and making herself vulnerable. So when she is done, what we're going to do is we're going to unmute. In fact, everybody should unmute be right now because if we if we if something is funny, we want to laugh. We want her to hear our laughter, and um, and then at the very at the end, we're just going to do what I call appreciative listening. We're going to clap really loud and hoot and holler in, in appreciation. Okay, so because this is really a brave thing to do. So go ahead, Jen. Please read. We are listening. This is version one. The brown russet potato rolled across the warm parquet floor. The dirt crusted and wedged in its, its crevices before the unforgiving hands pulled it from the soil. The potato shudders in fear, not knowing what fate awaits. It longs to return to its earthy home. This is two. The cold russet potato rolled across the worn parquet floor. The dirt crusted in the crevices, earned through growth. Unforgiving cold hands pulled this unsuspecting being from its dark familiar home. The potato waits and shudders in angst. The scent moist, of moist humus turned to the acrid taste of diesel, suffocating the root while the blinding light. And I didn't finish that. <laughs> okay, yay, woohoo! All right. Hey. I mean, I thought that second version really did have more life in them, especially when it came to the pulling it out of the, the promise and the the the, it, the the action. And that's actually what I want to talk to you about. I think a lot of people think, okay, we're gonna add sensory detail, we're gonna add all the lengthy descriptions. Um, and there are authors who do that, and God bless them. Um, and actually, there are times when you do want to have that. You're describing a location, and a location is important. It's a character in your book or your story. And um, there are moments when lots of detail, sensory detail is wonderful. But there are times when it can bog you down, too. So I recommend after you leave today, go back to what you've written a third time and see if instead of adjectives, you can bring in more verbs and add tension to the story that way. Uh, in fact, I, I almost feel like I'm doing a bait and switch here in this workshop because, well, not really, but what I'm, really, what I'm trying to talk, to talk about is using sensory details to for <laughs> the story. And I mean, I actually did start to feel nervous for that potato. So that was really good. Um, but I, I am gonna give you guys a handout. I have a, a story by, Haruki Murakami from the September 6th, New Yorker, but it's actually a story back from 2005 that I think they chose it because it's so it speaks to right now so well. Um, and if you go and it's it's called the year of spaghetti and it's, it begins 1971 was the year of spaghetti. In 1971, I cooked spaghetti to live and live to cook spaghetti. Okay, so here are a few details, sensory details. Steam rising from the pot was my pride and joy. 
but it's not, it's, there are no real adjectives there, no even adverbs. Um, so steam rising from the pot was my pride and joy, tomato sauce bubbling up in the saucepan, my one great hope in life. And he goes on to say that he, he had a huge aluminum pot. So that those are some adjectives there. Big enough to bathe a German shepherd. I mean, that's, that's a huge pot, right? That's a lot of spaghetti. Um, and he goes on to say that the, here he brings in scent, fine particles of garlic, onion, and olive oil swirled in the air forming a harmonious cloud that penetrated every corner of my tiny apartment, permeating the floor and the ceiling and the walls, my clothes, my books, my records, my tennis racket, my bundle of old letters. It was a, frag a fragrance one might have smelled on ancient Roman aqueducts. This is the story from the year of spaghetti, 1971 AD. Um, so again, very few adjectives there, but but I can smell that oil, right? Can you smell that uh, that garlic? It's just, it's everywhere. Um, it's permeating. Um, and I can hear, actually, he used that verb, permeating. I think that's critical. Um, so then he goes on. And he, he, he the, what, what ends up happening in this story is that he, he gets a phone call. He says he, he's hoping he wants to eat a spaghetti alone. And you know, he, he believes spaghetti must be eaten alone. But then he gets a phone call and there's a young woman who wants information from him. Um, and she says, everybody's pretending that they don't know, but there's something important I have to tell him. So please, he wa she wants to find a guy that this, the spaghetti eater knows. And she needs information from him because she lent him money that she really needs back. Um, and she, he just will not give it to her. Uh, he just doesn't want to give it to her. And what he ends up doing is he creates a fictitious pot of boiling water says he's making spaghetti to avoid her phone call. And then at the end, I'm gonna read you just the very end, um, or actually a few lines toward the end. Thinking about spaghetti that boils etern eternally but is never done is a sad, sad thing. So he's used spaghetti to get this girl off of his back um, but he regrets it because he realizes this guy is a, a no good guy. He probably does owe her the money. She sounds kind of desperate. And he ends the story this way. Durham semolina, golden wheat waiting in Italian fields. Can you imagine how astonished the Italians would be if they knew that they were, they were exporting in 19, that, that what they were exporting in 1971 was really loneliness. So that is an example of how he has taken the sensory experience and given it emotional impact. So that it's not, it's not just details, it's an experience that ends up impacting us and how we feel. So um, is there anybody else who'd like to read or would you like to have another go at the third draft um, of expanding this? And do I have any readers here? Any other, anybody else? Greg, go ahead, let's flip. All right. The small object is a black plastic dog laying on its back with its legs up in the air. It's what's considered a tchotchke. And because it is such, it also doubles as a placeholder for a bottle of, of wine or cider with the top of the bottle uh, amusingly going inside the dog's mouth as if it is guzzling the bottle to its content. Uh, the object uh, looks similar to my dog Hershey, which is why I suppose it was purchased by my ex-mother-in-law way back when. 
uh, since I'm no longer married, it reminds me of her as well as my ex-wife. The dog and bottle of cider are now dusty after surviving several moves and being left on display. Uh, the bottle of cider is now several years older and it reminds me of the fall trips uh, my ex-wife and I used to take to a local apple orchard. I can recall the sweet acidic taste of the cider and the sugary texture of the donuts we bought that fall day back in 2017. We wandered up a trail walking on dead leaves full of vibrant red and brown colors. Instead of picking apples like others, uh, we came to a clearing and took a selfie. It was a happy moment and we later came back down the trail uh, and perused the gift shop. Uh, much like the, the dusty dog that sits on my table, my glass table in full display, uh, these memories of my wife are also covered in a layer of thin dust. They are they're all, they're always there and I go back to them just as when I occasionally return my glance to this black plastic dog with a bottle of cider in its mouth. Woohoo, all right, yes. Yay, Yay. ready to go, Greg. Now, I think that, that did exactly what I was talking about. I mean, we don't think, I definitely got a feeling of um, the emotional content of this object. Um, so, um, I, yeah. would you mind actually reading the very first version for us? Well, the first version was just the beginning of the story and then I just- Oh, okay, yeah, that does happen in this situation where the, the beginning is, is really just, you know, the, the, what, what the object is. Yeah. But I really liked how you use the object as a jumping off point to go in other directions. Um, that was excellent. So, um, any, I think um, another, uh, I mean, I could, you could go even further. I, so we could have crunching underground, but it's a tricky balance with sensory details between doing too much. And, you know, this was, I think the flavors were, it was good to focus on the flavors like you did, because if we, if we got every sense in there, it would diminish the flavors. And I think that's, that was the focus. Um, and, and bringing the dust to the memories of both both the human and the object was, was excellent. So um, is there anyone else who would like to read? Go ahead, Francesca. And um, if, you, if you have a, the first version and the second version, that's great. If it's the, if it blends in, that's fine. Uh, no, I have, it's one paragraph, two times, so I'll. <laughs> So, um, and I, I kind of went more in to the memory of the, well, whatever, I'll stop talking about it. I'll just read the thing. Okay, <laughs> version one. Uh, I remember Mr. Salazar used the word sensual when describing the act of throwing a clay pot on a wheel and half of my classmates giggled. It was too salacious a notion for my 15 year old brain. I couldn't comprehend the idea of pleasure being sensory and not necessarily sexual. And so I was immediately uncomfortable, stomach drop anxiety. So that was one. Uh, and then this is two. Mr. Salazar was sitting behind a pottery wheel in a clay fleck denim shirt, molding a piece of clay with both hands as he kept the wheel spinning with his foot. He described the experience as sensual to my classmates and I and half the class giggled. I tried to laugh, but could only blush. In my 15 years of life, sensory pleasure was limited and foreign. And though I didn't fully comprehend my discomfort, I felt it viscerally stomach drop, gut punch, a prickle in my veins. Thank you. Woo -hoo! All right. Um, so, you know, keeping it only positive, um, what did other people hear? Did I, did I, what stood out to you in terms of the, I mean, that one addressed the entire concept of sensory experiences itself. Oh, wait, actually, wait, Francesca, what was your, what was your object? Was it a, um, it was actually, I was getting to the bowl that I made in class. I had a feeling it was something clay. Yeah, <laughs> I but, didn't get there yet. <laughs> that's fine, that's Approaching fine. It. So for other people, did, what stood out to you? What do you remember? Go ahead, Chuck. Yeah, I think, uh, I don't remember the exact words, but the uh, second ver version of the first line, explaining or uh, describing your teacher, I think that was a great improvement 
over that and kind of led into uh, going from him to the class. So I, I think that there's a little bit of censure about what he wore, his clothes. I think that was a great improvement. So that was a good job. Right. It's amazing how it doesn't take a ton to bring us into the experience. Um, and the stomach dropping, that that description was very strong to begin with. Yeah. So um, now that a few people have warmed up the, the seat, do we um, have a, another reader? I'll go for it. OK, Hera. great. Great, Hera. Um, I'm just going to read it all as one because um, first paragraph just sort of slides into the second one which was like okay, the second uh, assignment yeah. tell us what your object was um a piece of driftwood okay that i found on the beach okay strolling the beach my eagle eye scans the sand for the ocean's treasures offered up after each storm i spot a small piece of driftwood that is shaped like a songbird i carefully pick it up rubbing my hand across its rough and textured surface and examine it like I'm an ornithologist who just found a petrified bird. It is perforated over and over by what I assume are the boring holes from sea worms. In this case, the worm gets the bird. I love combing the beach but don't always appreciate all the smells that permeate the atmosphere. The rotting fish and shellfish are reminders that death is prevalent here. The ebb and flow of the ocean is a metaphor for the constant flow between life and death within, within there and its adjoining beach. And as you can guess, I live at the shore. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So, um, I mean, I definitely could see how in this situation, the you know the tension between life and death is uh, you know life and death. That's always a good subject. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, you see it on the beach all the time. Yeah. Yeah. So, so what do people observe about how sensory experiences came into play in this piece? Go ahead, Allison. I like that the, the smell, I mean, I, th I think the use of the smell when it comes in is really, uh, is really effective. And um, we've gotten some other kinds of descriptions earlier, but then the smell comes in and that get, that's really provoked an instant reaction. Absolutely, scent is so strong. It, 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 for, I, I think it's the most powerful sense in terms of sparking memories. Um, it's stronger than taste and all of the others and it's even sight. So it's the thing that brings us back the most. Um, yeah, and I, if, if, if as long as you've been by the ocean, you know that that brackish smell. Yeah. So um, did anyone else want to read? Any other volunteers? Um, <laughs> Oh, go ahead, Andrea. Is it Andrea or Andrea? It's Andrea. Okay, go ahead and tell us what your object was. I'll show it to you. It's this little clock. This oh, great. Okay. Little clock. Okay. It's heavy, heavier than it looks. My dad gave it to me out of the blue one day, a tiny, heavy gift, gold colored with a tiny clock face on the front, a tiny handle on top. I loved getting a gift from him for no reason at all. I put it on my desk to see the time when he lived 3000 miles away. He got cancer. He had an autologous stem cell transplant. To do this, he had to live on the Stanford in the Stanford Cancer Center for five weeks. It saved his life for a while, but eventually the chemo he had before the stem cell experiment got him gave him another kind of cancer. At the end, he was in home hospice. I was there with my mom, my brother's far away. 
I played for him his favorite music, opera arias on his laptop, as he labored bre breathing in his hospital bed, a sandpapery whisper, and I lay on the king-size bed he and my mom had shared. I didn't know how close he was to death. It was a blur. We got a humidifier to see if that would ease his breath. My husband brought a TV into his room to give him something to do, but he never got to it. He was too busy dying. I thought about reading aloud to him excerpts from my manuscript to make him proud of me, but I didn't, realizing that doing so would be to boost me, not him. His sandpaper breathing was the soundtrack, background music to those last few days. It became a soothing companion, a language, metronomic, rhythmic, a way to know he was there until in the golden light of morning, he wasn't. Oh, yes. Thank you. Thank you. That was one of those moments of because I was so struck by it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, wow. So, what stood out to you? Remember. Go ahead, Greg. Uh, the sandpaper, sandpaper whisper or breathing, also, I think. Absolutely. And I, I mean, it was, it was really interesting in this case, how the lack of description of the initial music, I mean, initially arias are mentioned, other types of music are mentioned, but there's no description. It's the breathing that gets described. And so that's that choice, the choice of, of what you just, of what you cho choose to, to describe is so critical and, and how difficult. It's very hard to make those choices. So don't be surprised when you find it tricky, it is. And the only way to, to get through it is to experiment. And that that was gorgeous, just really powerful um, the, that that became the prevalent sound. Another line that stood out to me was just, he was too busy dying. Yeah, that really, so it's a, a very moving piece, yeah. Allison? Yeah. The other thing I was just going to add is I was really struck by, in the beginning, you used the adjective heavy, and I thought that was a really good use of the adjective um, because it, I mean, it really does set up the whole thing. You're talking about it's a heavy gift. It's a heavy in more, gift in more than one way, um, but there it's meant very literally that the clock is heavy, but it, it really gets us, it, it leads us into what's going to going to come, uh, which is a heavy gift. Um, and uh, so I just thought that was a, a really good use of an adjective. Also, the, just the very fact that it was a clock. Right? I was just going to say that, that, that it's ironic that the story begins with a clock, which measures time, and then it concludes with the end. You know what I mean? It's it's just, and it's a beautiful clock because time, I guess it's almost like the expression of like the time of his daughter was beautiful or is beautiful, life is beautiful. And, you know, it was just, uh, and it was just told nicely with the beginning of that and then the end, so. Which brings me back to another adjective that I think was perfect was metronomic, mm -hmm. it's both time and music. So that, that, that's a very nice choice, yeah. Um, thank you. So did anyone else want to read? Are any, any other volunteers? Yeah, this. Sorry? Oh, I, I, somebody put their hand up virtually. Oh, oh, who did? I didn't, I missed Oh, that. hi, that's me. Um, uh, oh, Alex? No, Logan. Oh, Eli. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> I don't usually have this many people. My workshops are limited to, you know, 12 or under. So go ahead, Lee, Eli. Okay. Um, so I just have more of the, like, less of the writing itself and more of, like, the transformation process. Like, I just uh -huh. wanted to say that really quick. Oh, um, that's great. That's great. Yeah. The, uh, thank you. The, um, the scene that I have been thinking about writing recently is I have, um, like this isn't a manuscript that I'm already writing where my, my narrator is about five years old and his parents are arrested. And, but it happens at home. And I know like what is happening at the time, but I've been having a hard time trying to figure out how to like translate that into his view just because he's so young. 
And, and, and I knew at some point, you know, it becomes scary for him. So he runs and hides, but I couldn't figure out, you know, how to, you know, again, how to make that scene work. Um, I was moving stuff from my dad's house recently. So a bunch of like my childhood things are just in my office with me, which is why, again, my camera's not on because my room is full of things. But, um, uh, but looking around, I realized, oh, um, so I have these childhood objects. My narrator is hiding in his toy box. So throughout this whole thing. So I'm, so what sort of, what sort of really helped by looking at all those, these, these things that I have here, you know, like where you're, like um, the sounds of the scene became different because it's not like clear, it's more of like thudding because, you know, hearing people walk around in this house and more of like, like feeling because he's hiding in this box with, you know, lots of, you know, plastic pointy things contrasting with, you know, soft things that like, you know, things that rattle if he moves too quickly. Like um, it kind of gave more of like a, um, a depth in that sense. And for me is helping me like while he might not entirely know what's going on in the other room, you know, like he's hearing like these people walk around, but like, so like the sounds are different, the feelings are different. And so it feels a little bit more accessible to write, just write that, you know, that scary scene just cause he's so young, so. Well, that's great. I'm glad that that helped. Yeah, actually that's what I, why I brought up at the beginning. I was wondering if anyone found that the object brought stories to mind because it did for me. And I found that ironic because I often bring a huge tub of objects and there are of course my own objects when I, when mm -hmm. I bring a tub of objects to workshop. But I found that the objects that I chose this week, I mean, I've come up with so many different stories that I had forgotten about. And so it's true that things around your house, if you really, you know, I mean, this is my passport. That's, that's what I was, that's one of the things I was working with this week. And just, you know, mm -hmm. you look at the picture and go, wow, that's a different time. And you can ab absolutely, that was a great use of what was happening in your life and then transferring it to fiction. Mm -hmm. um, and okay. that, yeah, that, that creates this huge possibility for so many sensory experiences. Oh, you're right, the thudding that he's going to be hearing, um, that can mm -hmm. be scary. Because, you know, being a kid, we, we idealize it as adults, but it can the smaller things scare them right so yeah yeah yes so uh, it's um so this um this helped out a lot so thank you i'm, I'm really glad i'm really glad um so i i recommend that actually i thought about it i think i'm gonna do that i i, I keep a notebook handy and i'm always making lists and i think it's a great thing i uh, actually it's in pat schneider's book alice and i i'll admit that i can't remember who there are a lot of writers do this. They make lists and often lists of nouns, and then they use that as inspiration. Um, so remember that writing isn't always, uh, you know, you're sitting there, you're absolutely composing, but there's all kinds of things that you could use in your life to, to, to as part of the process. So if, you know, throughout your day, you're like a ah, toothbrush, you know, the next, and then the next object you come into contact with is, coffee grinder and then the next one you know you can make those lists and later on when you come back to them it's surprising how often there's some kind of story in there even just based on one of them and spark your imagination and i'm i'm holding them i'm playing with this orange as we see <laughs> <laughs> um, so and, and it smells wonderful um so yeah, I'm guilty of often like leaving an orange peel on my desk as, you know, in instantaneous potpourri. <laughs> um, so let's see, um, we have a few more minutes. Is there someone else who would like to read? Um, okay, so what I did was I put in the um, chat, I put a handout in there and if you, as, can everybody, is everybody able to download that? Because that has the story. Um, it actually has the, the, the story that I read from. The very short story. It's unusual in a New Yorker to have anything this short. Um, so I recommend actually reading the entire thing. Um, and then if you go back to the first page, um, 
I just wanted you guys to, to be able to contact me um, and uh, to let you know that I have that I lead workshops and I do coaching and editing. And there's a you can sign up for the newsletter here. There's just uh, every way, every which way to con to contact me. So was everybody able to download that? Uh, no, my computer won't let me. Uh... It, it, it says okay, uh, there are definitely some computers that don't so what you can do is my email address is just is rachel at phillywriters.com oh, oh, rachel at uh, rachel at it's r-a-c-h-e-l at philly writers.com oh, uh, what if i uh and you can just send me an email and I will shoot this back to you. What if I gave you my email in the chat and you uh, sent it that to me? Works that works too. That works as well. You guys can, if you, if you have <laughs> trouble with this, you can definitely, um, you can definitely send it, send me, send me your email in your chat and I will send this to everybody. Um, yeah. So, um, um, where is the, um, where can I access the, the PDF? I'm not, um, I'm on my iPad. Is it something within Zoom or? It's in, it's within Zoom. It's in the, in the chat. Do you see at the bottom of your screen, there's a little bubble, like a cartoon bubble and it says chat. Uh, yeah, I'm in the, I'm in the chat and um, the last, you know, I see people's, you know, emails. I see other things, but I'm not seeing, you know, any icon or link. Okay, or it's actually a, a document. It's a PDF icon. Yes, it's not. Um, a, but if you if you shoot me your email, I can I can send it to you. Okay. Okay. So yeah, that would be helpful. I'm just. Uh, I guess I'm. Maybe maybe since I'm on my iPad, I'm not seeing yeah, what, what else is different, different on different things. Um. So I will. There we are. Take everybody's um, email addresses. There, I got you. Okay. Ashley, um, Alex, do I need to be taking these right now, or will they disappear at the end? I guess uh, I can. I can copy them all down for you too. Okay. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Because I wanted to see if if anyone has any questions um, uh, about this. I have a question. Go ahead. Uh, hi, I'm Christine. Um, I write in my stories and novels. I tend to write a lot of dialogue. And um, are you, when you're writing, do you consciously, I mean, I don't know if you're more of a poet, but um, consciously look for places for sensory detail when you're revising, um, focusing on maybe a particular sense to engage the reader with? You know, I think that's actually what um, I, I, I started as a screenwriter, so I often have I'm dialogue heavy as well, um, although, although I definitely have gotten away from that a little bit. Um, I guess that's what I really wanted to, to lead you toward, and I think it's hard in a short period of time, but um, is when it make it should make sense for the story. I mean, it, I wouldn't just shove sensory details in there, but I think look at it in terms of your character development. I mean, we have this short story. He has an entire, he doesn't, he just, he doesn't only describe this year where all he ate was spaghetti. Um, it becomes part of his emotional landscape. And I think that's what you want to do. And a lot of times when there's a ton of detail, it can become a little bit like the reader, they're just lost in space, they're talking heads. So to ground them, I think touch can often be important in that situation. You know, do they do they lean on a piece of furniture? Do they, you know, are, are they so emotional that they're uh, leaning forward on their and their heels are off the ground? Um, placing them in the space where they are, I think, is important because I can't really imagine them in the middle of a conversation having, although we, I'm, well, actually in human experience, everything happens, but I can't imagine a huge spinoff to 
but actually I know that I've had, I have definitely used cooking with my characters, right? Yeah, there's times when, or, you know, so that brings in smell or times when they're going somewhere where I could see them having a donut and cider. Um, so those are times when if they're, it is great when you have dialogue to have them doing something together and it can heighten the conflict. You never know when you're having a dialogue and they would be like, hey, you have siblings, you know, or a mother and daughter, you always take the first bite of my ice cream sundae. You know, it can become a, an, a, an offshoot, a detour that tells you something about that relationship or shows you something about the relationship. So I think those are ways to bring in sensory details that, that enrich it. But the idea really is to make sure that you're informing us about the character and increasing the tension, using it to, to help us understand their emotional life and why, what motivates them. So this is this, you know, this spaghetti, he's using it as a way to avoid people. And then he kind of regrets it. And it's a kind of realization, like, what have I been doing? You know, why have I been shutting people out so much? I actually could have helped this girl. Um, and I think, it, I think it speaks to our lives now, you know, with, with all the ways we interact that aren't interactive. <laughs> she, I'm saying as I'm sitting here on Zoom. <laughs> but, the, but this actually does feel pretty interactive. Does that help, Christine? Yes, very much. Thank you. Great, great. I'm glad. Um, any other questions? Chuck. Yeah. yeah. Rachel, just wondering whether you have any current so short story or lyrical essay writers that you enjoy, uh, the, the form you like, and uh, just what's, what's your next uh, workshop coming up? What's it about? Um, well, you know what? It's I do so much reading of my own students and editing clients that I that off the top of my head I can't think of anybody, but I I'd need to think about that and, and write a list. Um, but um, I know I have there's plenty of writers. I just I I uh, yeah I have to have I I do have a list somewhere. I gotta have it handy. I'm sorry about that, but um, I have a workshop have workshops going on right now that are all booked up but i'll have new ones starting in january so definitely get yourself on the waiting list because i do go back to the waiting list and january is bound to be different i might be doing different sets of workshops based with some in person and some on zoom so um yeah, I'm trying to think. Allison, do you can you think of someone off the top of your head? It's so hard. Whenever I get that question, I'm like, wow. Well. <laughs> I know your mind kind of kind of goes blank. Um, uh, I can think specifically of thinking about short story. Was you wanting or? Um... I can think of some classic writers that you know. Yeah, like, short stories or prose poets, anything like that. Anything short, flash fiction, anything. I'm okay, okay, sort of on the shorter side. Yeah. You know, this is a really old one. But it's interesting. Um, and um, oh God, Black Tickets, Jane Ann Phillips. It was published in the 80s. And it was kind of a big thing when this came out because it, and they're short, they're like Flash. Um, and nobody really did that at that time. Um, and some of them kind of connect, but they don't fully connect, you know, so it's, it's, it, it'll be interesting to take a look at that, I think, um, you know, what she does in those small, uh, small spaces. Um, also, you know, my mother does it really well. I mean, even the reviewers said that. I know it's, kind of, <laughs> it's really easy to remember my mother's name. <laughs> Her short stories, uh, the, sen the sensory detail is excellent. She has an incredible memory, so she brings in from her life, but it is fiction. Um, so her name is Joanne Coben. And her short stories are actually, if you Google, I think some of them are available just uh, online. Um, I'm sorry, which, uh, which book did you mention, Allison? It's Jane Ann Phillips, and she spells it J-A-Y-N-E, um, and it's called Black Tickets. Also, I mean, thank you. Hemingway is famous for being so concise and yet bringing in just a few details. Um, got, yeah, another, you know, George Saunders also uh, for, for very, um, you know, contemporary. Yeah, he... Um, 
he's uh, he's certainly somebody to look at. And actually, I've I it's it's on my list because I like like Rachel. I'm often reading other people's manuscripts, so sometimes I don't read. I need a stretch when I'm not reading other people's manuscripts in order to kind of um, read other than you know stuff in periodicals. But um, his book, uh, his book on writing is really, really good. A number of people have told me, and it's got this long title, uh, <laughs> but if you Google him, it'll, it'll come up. Okay, it is- so George, There you go, Let Rachel George has Rogers, it. Swim in a Pond in the, in the Rain, and I haven't yet read it. I have just got it, and I haven't read it yet. So yes, A Swim in, in a Pond in the Rain. Well, this is about writing, but I think there are a lot of examples in the book. Yeah, because he, he's yeah. looking at, some, some um, Chekhov and I think Dostoevsky too stories anyway. Um, I was going to say that's one of those are some of my favorite examples. I mean, the lady. Yeah, Chekhov is great. The lady I mean, the lap dog, and you can't get you can't go wrong with a, a book of short stories by Chekhov. Um, yeah. And, and, you know, I would say these are kind of longer stories, but um, Alice Munro uh, is one of my favorite. Um, and if you're and now. if you're interested in kind of the novelistic sort of short story or the, the novel that sort of she she can really it's amazing what she can do in a few pages um and they do have that novelistic very full quality um but so she's that's, yeah, that's Alice Monroe, which is m-u-n-r-o yeah um, so um, look around here what else do i have and um I'm pulling up poetry right here but uh <laughs> yeah. oh gosh yeah, yeah. I have oh. actually, all the books right here are writing books as opposed to actual <laughs> literary literature. But um, N.K. Jemison is interesting. I mean, it's science fiction, and that's not short. But um, she's pretty amazing at, at at giving you not a ton of, of being concise. And yeah, um, so also, um, oh mm -hmm. gosh. Yes, um, so he teaches he used to teach at Rosemont or he may still um flash fiction um oh Ra uh Randall yes yeah, yeah uh, what the heck is his last name <laughs> I have his book in brown. I, I think it's brown isn't it yes Randall Brown Randall Brown yeah yes, he's excellent his his flash fiction is fabulous very good um and actually yeah yes Randall Brown very good. It's two L's at the end, but yeah. <laughs> ah, Eli, you're lucky. Very lucky. Yeah. So, okay. Well, um, it was wonderful to have you all. Thank you for being here and please reach out. Um, feel free to, to contact me and, um, and I really appreciate your writing. Thank you all. All right. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Have a wonderful rest of your day. You Thanks. too. Yeah.